Okay, good morning everybody. Um, it's a bit of a tall order coming up with ideas for autism friendly strategies in around 45 minutes, given that Joe and I are known to, be, to talk far too long and never let anybody else get a word in edgeways, but we'll do the best that we can. Um, I just need to correct you, I haven't been in autumn for 38 years, I'm not that old honestly, um, but I've been around for about 25 years and Joe's been in autism for 11 years, so between the two of us you're getting about 35 years worth of experience. Um, I'm retiring at Christmas and I'm pleased to say that Joe's been appointed as the new principal from January and so hopefully you'll get another 30 years out of Joe as well, so that, that should be good for the world of autism. Um, now, every one of the areas we've chosen to speak about could in fact lead on to an hour or more's further discussion. So we're very well aware about um, how we're just giving you an overview of some of our top tips. We do believe there'll come some way in improving the school experience for pupils with, with autism. If you're interested in obtaining any further information about any of the areas, uh, you can always contact our school, Radlett Lodge. So the first tip is make communication make sense. We need to ensure that the people with autism understand what we are trying to tell them. This is not necessarily through language um, or the spoken word. In fact, we do say that language can often be used wrongly and can be a barrier to learning for our pupils. So use visual supports to supplement your language or don't initially use any language at all. If the visual cues are right, and then perhaps you don't need to bombard the student with too much language. At Radlett, sometimes we get staff to um, do silent lessons, and it's really interesting to see that if they use the visual cues um, and modelling and pointing, you can see how the environment can become calmer, students are able to attend and concentrate more, and inappropriate behaviours are often reduced. So here you can see some examples of some of the visual supports that we use. So you can see that we've got, um, with the yellow border, a jig for pupils to be able to make toast by themselves. And if they follow the symbols correctly, they can do that as independently as possible without the need for too much language. Um, the photograph is a young lad who's only about five years of age, and because of the the clear way that the visuals are set out, you can see he's very young, but he's able to do so much of the work by himself. The top right-hand corner, um, we have a jig of a young lad who sometimes he's in the school during the day, but he has respite at our school, so sometimes he's in school during the holidays and at weekends. So because of the confusion that he was having, we can show you very simply on a daily basis whether he's in the school, whether he's in the lodge, and whether he's at home, and it helps reduce a lot of his stress. The other example is a dressing jig or an undressing jig so that the pupil in sequence can follow um, how to dress and undress himself, again, without a lot of adult support or language. Um, we use other types of visual jigs, but they've got to be differentiated to the level of ability of that particular child. Um, some of the visual supports can be objects of reference, where we might use something like a paintbrush to show them that they're about to do an art activity, or a cup to show that it's they're due to have a drink. Um, other, other things can be photographs, but again, we don't use photographs often because sometimes they can be confusing if the photograph isn't accurate to what the pupil will be working with. But what I really want you to get from this is that to remember a visual support is permanent. The spoken word can last a second. The next tip is make your communication make sense by keeping language simple, using small chunks of language at a time, and if you need to repeat an instruction, firstly, make sure you give the person with autism enough time to process the information. And again, we found through experience that with typically developing children, they can usually respond to instructions almost straight away. We found with our children, we have to leave and give them an inordinate amount of time, in many instances, to process that language. If you do need to uh, give an instruction again, 
use exactly the same phrase, otherwise the student will have to process that different language all over again. So it's very different to say, go and get your coat on, and then say, come on, hurry up, it's playtime, go and get your coat. It's a completely different set of language that, that child is trying to process. Very simple, but ensure you have the individual's attention. Begin with their name. We find that if we give an instruction to the whole class, invariably they don't take any notice, but we do actually have to give the child's name. Many of our students also have difficulty with abstract concepts and phrases and have a literal understanding of some of the things that we say. <coughs> so watch what you say. So I'm going to give you some of the classics that our children are just not going to understand. You've got a chip on your shoulder. Pull your socks up. It's raining cats and dogs. And I know of a story of a young um, lad who was going through adolescence and he was in the classroom one day in a mainstream school. And one minute he was talking in a very high-pitched voice and then the next second he was talking in a very deep voice and he was getting very confused and worried about this. Can anybody guess what the teacher said to him? It's okay, your voice is breaking. <coughs> So you can imagine the young lad was absolutely terrified of the fact that he's, any minute his voice is going to break, so you better not say anything at all. We have another example of a very able pupil who was actually in a shopping centre near the school one day, and they were about to go down the escalators, and he just stopped and said, I can't go down the escalator. And we asked him why he couldn't go down there, and he said, because I haven't got a dog. And then he pointed to the sign at the top of the escalator, you must carry dogs on the escalator. <laughs> so another tip is help them to make their communication make sense. So some of our students at Radlett are non-verbal or use one or two single words. They could use short sentences or are able to use language at a high level. Assessment of the pupil's communicative ability is absolutely vital. We have students at our school who have limited speech but understand at a much higher level. And equally, we have some very verbal students who have a much lower level of understanding or often don't understand the social rules. So there's often a misunderstanding with our new staff or in inexperienced staff. They think that verbal students are much more able than they actually are. So we always need to bear that in mind, assessment is absolutely key. Some of the examples that we give in terms of supporting communication, in no particular order, include PECS books, picture exchange communication systems, um, and sentence strips to help the child to focus um, and structure the sentence that they want to give. We have choice boards, Choice boards where they can choose what they want to do for leisure activities. They can choose rewards for completing work. Um, we have choice boards where they can describe how they're feeling on a particular day or at a different time of day. We use key rings, so again, the pupil will have a key ring. And as they wander around the school independently or go out to play, if they do need to communicate with somebody, they've got something on hand that they can use very quickly to show a member of staff. We use help cards. They're dotted all around the school for pupils to actually ask for help whenever they want to. Um, and it's really important that a young person has that ability to ask for help. In less specialist settings, perhaps a mainstream school, it would be useful to identify a person or key people that the pupil could always go to to talk to about things. We've got to remember again that autism, we know, is a social disorder. Students need to learn the social skills um, and, the, uh, dif and different social skills at different times of the day. Play times, break times, having lunch can be very difficult times for people with autism. To some extent, when they're in the classroom, that's structured and they know what to expect in that situation. Students need to learn skills such as listening, taking turns, looking at another person, and listening to a wider variety of conversational topics than they might be prepared to do. Put some structure in at these times so young people know what to do in different social contexts. 
But some of these things that I've told you about are not just for the non-verbal child. Um, we know that sentence strips could actually help verbal children to sequence their thoughts and put their ideas down in a coherent way. And we also know from um, some young adults with autism telling us, we know one particular young man, very able man, but he said when he was feeling extremely anxious or very worried about things, he could not process spoken language and he asked that when he was in those situations that people would just use symbols or visuals to help him to get through that difficult period of his period during the day. Again, in terms of helping them to make sense, some of our pupils are more motivated by using communication devices um, through the use of assistive technology. We did start using the old chunky voice output devices such as Dynavoxes, um, but they were often costly, would break down and sometimes difficult to program. So iPads and iPhones have greatly advanced the possibilities for some of our children. But we know we need to take care when we um, introduce those to children because they need support to, to use them functionally from the onset otherwise they can become easily distracted by all the other functions. And here you see a photograph of one of our um, teenage girls who's using her iPad to actually tell the story of the lighthouse keeper's lunch. Okay. Environment. We also need to support appropriate behaviour. We do this in order to improve their long-term quality of life, life chances, and to enable them to be accepted and to participate in the many opportunities there are in the community. Sorry, my, my throat is very dry up here. Thanks. Coping with transitions, a really important aspect of the, of the way that we need to support our pupils. Our pupils don't cope well with change and prefer established routines. Changes to these routines can cause anxiety and can potentially lead to inappropriate behaviour or a pupil becoming very withdrawn. These transitions are so important, whether it be the internal small transitions like suddenly a change of lesson, working with a new teacher or getting new school uniforms, so some of the small transitions, but also we need to look at the big life changes, such as moving house, becoming an adult, or leaving school and going on to college or further education, etc. What we really do believe passionately is all of the things that we do at our school, be it the primary, secondary age pupils, is the skills that we want to teach them are things that will support them in adult life. What we do in our early school life can impact on how well they cope during adulthood and we always need to bear that in mind. So we have transition plans that we put in place and these detail how these ch changes are going to occur, who will be involved and including the views wherever possible of the young person. But in order to support our young people, we need to try and empathise with them. Now, many of us here perhaps don't know what it's like to have autism, but we do need to have an understanding of how life might, might be for them. And that's why it was really interesting listening to Lawrence earlier, because it, by listening to people, we can get, gain some insight into what it's like to, to have to cope with some of the pressures of today. And also, when we're talking about behaviour, again, the example that Lawrence gave about being punished um, and about going to the head's office. Um, we need to th not just think behaviour and punishment, we need to think of autism. We therefore has have to understand about the difficulties that um, people with autism face, the difficulties that I'm sure you, you all know about communication, social understanding and social communication, social rules, they change in different contexts. What works one day with one person doesn't necessarily work the next day. So it's fairly obvious that people can get in trouble without even realising it. Um, they can have difficulty in understanding, recognising 
others' emotions and an inability to explain their own feelings. There's many, many sensory issues, which Joe will talk about later on. And they all impact on the way that our students see the world or indeed cope with everyday life. So bearing these in mind, tips you might find useful is to, as I say, empathise, think autism and not just the behaviour. Don't take um, behaviours personally and also to use a positive approach to support the young person. We don't consider when we're supporting behaviours at Radlett that there is such a thing as punishment. Um, we need to look at exercise. That can be a key to reducing anxiety. Um, I used to teach a lad called James who, when he was um, about 14 or 15, he was having difficulties. He was going through puberty. And you knew that he was getting anxious because he'd start going around the classroom, closing and double-checking the doors were closed, all the cupboard doors were closed. He'd sit down to try and do some work, and the next second he'd back, be back up again, checking the doors were, were closed again. Um, you also realise after a while with James that he would get a very slight twitch at the top of his cheekbone and you knew when you saw that twitch that you had to do something very quickly before there was a major incident. Um, there were times when he got so anxious that he would bite staff and um, very deeply and at times we did have staff going off to hospital. So we did have to learn what are the triggers and what can we do to reduce his anxiety. So with James, we found very quickly that we had a running track at the back of the school and that we would, whatever task he was working on, we would say, well, we'd give him about another 10 seconds of working on that task and then say, well done, James, well done, good work, finished, and then show him visually the running track. So he would then go out onto the running track and we would show him vis visually again 10, 9, 8, 7, six, five, etc., till he got to the end. So he did 10 um, circuits of the running track and then he, he would be much calmer and then he'd be able to cope by going into the classroom. We also need to give our students opportunities to calm. And again, with one particular student, and they're all different, and there's different strategies for different people. We had one particular lad who, when he was very, very agitated, we used to get him to sit down to feel and be aware of his racing heartbeat, to take deep breaths, and while he was taking those deep breaths, he counted again down to 10. We also need to offer debriefs to our students after incidents or after they've become upset, but again, we obviously don't do that until we're absolutely certain that that pupil has calmed down. Also, if there is an incident or there's a very difficult behaviour going on, who shows up matters. We need to maintain a very calm, low arousal approach. Um, we don't want, if there's an incident going on, two, three, four, five, six members of staff rushing into the corridor or rushing into a classroom to see if they can be of help. All that will do it will be escalate the problem um, and make things a lot worse. Um, Sometimes we use strategies where um, somebody will walk by, and I saw a very good example of this the other day, where a lad was getting very distressed about something, and a member of staff, who he knew particularly well, walked into the classroom, said, hello, and then she fell over. She didn't actually really fall over, she did it on purpose, and then said, oh, oh, Paul, can you help me, can you help me to get up? And he completely snapped out of the, the incident that, that, that he was embroiled in. So it's knowing the staff member can be very, very important. And also, if that child has got a relationship with a key member of staff, sometimes it's appropriate to actually ask that person to manage the behaviour and the other person perhaps um, to, to disappear. On starting at Radlett, we actually view every behaviour as a communication. That's our starting point. When we know what the person is trying to communicate through the behaviour, we try to identify appropriate ways to communicate with an understanding of the individual needs of that child. So that, therefore, we develop behaviour support plans. 
And again, we say that is the key to consistency, so that every person who's working with that child, including parents at home or other professionals, the children may come in contact with if they have short breaks, etc. They all know what to do and they all fully understand the needs of that child. So things that we include are likes and dislikes. What does the child like? Is there anything they really do dislike which may cause them to be very upset? We need to look at triggers. What kind of things will make the person upset? Sensory issues. Are there sensory issues? And again, Lawrence was talking about um, the noise outside of his classroom when he was in school. All of these things impact on how that person with autism feels. Cues. What are the warning signs that a behaviour is about to happen? So, like I was saying with James earlier, the warning signs were that he started to um, check the doors constantly in the classroom or he started to have this facial twitch. So we need to know what are the cues, what are the warning signs. We also generally need to know about the proactive strategies um, that we would use. So generally, proactive strategies are things around the environment. Is the environment calm? Is it organised? Is it visually structured so that the pupils know what they're doing? We need to look at stress management. What kind of things can we do to help that child to relieve their own stress? So again, we're talking about things um, that I said about Leslie, how we teach him to calm down and to be aware of his heartbeat and to take deep breaths. If there's, a, is, if there's quite a severe incident, we also develop specific reactive strategies so that all staff will know what to do if there's an incident to try and get everything back together and calm as quickly as possible. So it would be in the behaviour support plan, do we evacuate the classroom, do we take the children out of the classroom, do we remind the pupils of the reward systems, etc. But in terms of dealing with supporting appropriate behaviour, there are other things that we do need to actually consider. How are they feeling? Are they in pain? Are they homesick? Are they hungry? Do we just need to give them breakfast to help them to calm down? Um, for more complex or more entrenched behaviours, there are many other strategies and tools that we can use. For example, we have anger management schemes of work. We have um, self-regulation skills that we teach children. We need often to do work on self-esteem or sometimes understanding their own diagnosis of autism. All of those strategies, though, we would, be, would be done at a very individual level and for many of these programmes we would also be seeking parental agree agreement because we know with some of our pupils it would not necessarily be appropriate for them to understand their own diagnosis because they haven't got that level of ability, uh, ability or it may actually cause them more concern. So a lot of that would be through parental discussion. But to be honest with you, um, talking about behaviour, I could actually spend three days talking to you about behaviour. Um, about any of these strategies to support the behaviour, what we think basically is if you've got the communication right, the child is working at the correct level assessed for their needs, so the tasks aren't at a level that gives them a lot of stress because it's too hard for them, or the tasks aren't at a level that is so easy they get bored and so they develop inappropriate behaviours as something to do. So they need to be working at the correct level and the environment needs to be right. Those are the most important elements, I believe, in supporting um, appropriate behaviour. Jill's now going to talk to you again about the importance of structure. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, the first top strategy, top tip I'm going to talk about is structure. Why structure? Well, it gives order and meaning to a world that doesn't always make sense makes rules and expectations of an event clearer, and it can give predictability. A phrase I've heard a number of times when people have been talking about autism is that you wouldn't take a white stick away from a person that was blind, so you do not take away the structure from the person with autism. It's a really basic premise, but so, so important. If we can just come away slightly from autism and think about every, everybody in the room can think about a time, either imaginary or something that they can remember, 
when on a Sunday evening you knew you had something important to do on the Monday morning, it might be a meeting, it might be a presentation, it might be an assignment to hand in at, at college, but you didn't have the details with you, um, you would naturally feel quite anxious about that. Some of us would feel very anxious about that. Some of us may even have a sleepless night about that. Now, we can make decisions about what we do about that. We can reassure ourselves, we could ring someone up. We can make the decision to arrive earlier um, and sort it out in the morning, all sorts of things. School children often can't do that, and school children with autism certainly find that much, much more difficult. Um, if we reflect on our own needs, we need to know what we're doing, when we're doing it, why we're doing it, how long, what happens, when we've finished. If, for example, you're finding Linda and I's presentation not that interesting, you can be thinking, well, don't worry, I can have a, my coffee break at quarter past 11. Later on today, I'll get a nice lunch, and at the end of the day, I go home, perhaps put my feet up, have a cup of coffee, a glass of wine, watch my favorite TV program. We can rationalize and sequence those things that are happening in the day. The people with autism can't always do that. Um, if you go back to the classroom now, we have, as educators of children with autism, a responsibility to ensure that they know what they're doing, when they're doing it, where they're doing it, how long they're doing it for, and what they're going to do when they're finished. If you look at the top photo, it's a form of teach workstation. We teach our children to go and collect um, an independent work tray so that they can work independently. Um, at a very basic level, when we're starting teaching this system, children will have three tasks that may be in a red wallet, a blue wallet, a yellow wallet, may be labelled one, two, three, may be labelled A, B, C, could be labelled um, with three photos of their favourite objects, so tw three tweenies or um, three Thomas the Tank Engine um, carriages, so it could be Percy, Henry and Thomas. They've got a jig in front of them that tells them the order which they do their tasks, um, and then they do each task in turn and move it to the right hand side so they know that they've finished. The jig that's on the table that says one, two, three could also have a symbol, a picture, some instructions for what the child does next. Tell your teacher you've finished, put your work away, choose something, go on the computer, collect your maths work, whatever it happens to be. Now that's obviously really important and helpful for a classroom. Um, and it means that the teacher has to intervene and support the pupil a lot less than would normally have to do. But it has applications to adult life as well and can help an individual learn how to sequence a whole range of tasks. And if you think about the way we perhaps do washing up or drying up, we move things from left to right or um, do the ironing, we might have a pile on the left that we start with and our finished piles on the right as well. So um, but that's really just about teaching a system that might help people work through um, and make sense of the work that they've got to do. If you look at the two photos, which have got jumbled up for some reason, they should have been together, but never mind, the two photos of P kits laid out, it's very clear that the one on the left doesn't, it's just quite, not quite as clear as what's expected. The one on the right immediately tells us the idea is that you put on, uh, put on these clothes in order, and that's just a little bit more helpful than, than the left-hand photograph. Um, the... Um, what's now the middle photo that says first trampoline and then Lego. This was something that supported a boy who was very anxious about putting his favorite pieces of Lego, Lego down. He liked to hold them, they help, helped him concentrate, etc. And though he loved the trampoline, he couldn't quite get, get this idea that to go on the trampoline safely, he had to put his Lego down. I think I need something like that for my ironing, actually. First ironing, then something else. Okay, I talked us, about us having our various strategies that we might do, do to help support us if we were anxious about something. And often that can be by writing lists, having things written in our file of access. It can be just remembering things. It could be just reassuring ourselves. All the children at Radlett Lodge and in many, or, uh, many schools for children with autism have some sort of timetable. These are some examples of differentiated timetables. So they've got mixed up in order as well, so please excuse me if I jump around the screen a, a little bit. Um, but the um, second one along is the objects of reference timetable. So I'm not sure whether you can see clearly, but there's a paintbrush that signifies art. There's a paper towel that's signifying washing hands before lunch, etc. The next stage would be, perhaps be a photograph timetable 
But as Linda said, there's a little bit of a caution about photographs. So don't put your going to a park and put a photo of a park up if you go to a different park, because that can be quite confusing. We've got two symbol timetables and we've got two word timetables. Emmanuel, the night before, used to write his words um, in sequence, so he knew the night before, and that was the really thing, thing that really helped him, while Finley would do the same thing but would sequence the words that were already written out for him. And the piece of paper on the right-hand side is obviously just typed up and the child can cross each lesson off as it, as it happens. And these schedules can be used for, they can be used for a lesson, for a morning, for a, for a whole day. Some of the more able children have weekly timetables, filofaxes, and in some National Autistic Society schools there's some good work going on around using iPhones and PDAs for scheduling as well. Within this, you also have to have systems for if things change so that we can prepare children um, for the unexpected. Um, we, we sometimes use simple red crosses, or sometimes it's a case of going over and almost um, physically, in short, you know, physically taking off one symbol and putting the next one on and almost exaggerating that so the child can see that that's what you're doing. Um, sometimes some of the strategies we do don't have to be that sophisticated. I once saw a teacher really very well, very successfully explaining to her class that they couldn't go out on the minibus um, because it was too icy, but they were going to do the trampoline instead through a series of really, really badly um, drawn pictures. So it, it didn't matter to the children that they, these pictures weren't laminated and beautifully done on the computer. They just cared about what was happening and why, and you know, why they weren't on the bus yet, etc. We also teach our children in a really rehearsed way about surprise and change, and by practicing um, putting things like the word surprise or the symbol surprise on a timetable, um, and then having a surprise party or a surprise trip out, we can help support the pupil um, understand that change and surprise are not always a negative thing, that they can be quite a positive thing. We can structure almost anything, the environment, work tasks, time, play, choose times, expectations for behaviour, and it doesn't sometimes have to be difficult. Sometimes it's just about minor adjustments and really trying to look at things from, from perhaps the perspective of what a, a person with autism might, might be able to see, what sense they might be able to make. Um, it's not difficult to see which environment is more autism friendly of the two photos. Our next top tip is to look at the sensory issues a person with autism has and mostly never, ever, ever to underestimate the part that they play. And Lawrence has already described some, some of his experiences. We can find it hard to, div hard to imagine quite how much um, the differences in sensory systems may play. But it really, the, what's important perhaps for us as educators is just to be no, know that and to be constantly trying to think like that, trying to, under, trying to understand. And it's great to see that recent research and the redevelopment of criteria has shown that there's increasing understanding of the, sense, the role that sensory differences play. An in individual may have, for example, heightened or reduced sensitivity to noise, sound, heat, touch, taste, sight or light, um, and that can result in difficulties screening out some of those sensory stimuli or becoming over bombarded. Um, we've got a girl who's been with us quite a long time at our school, and she um, can hear every time an aeroplane goes over the school, and we believe we might be on one of Luton flight paths, um, and you can see it in her face, you can see it in her body language. She copes with it, but you, know, you can visibly see what happens to her each and every time an aeroplane goes over the school. None of us can hear it. Um, and that you know, it makes me think about what other th how else is it for her? How are the other sounds in the classrooms? What, how else does it feel? What, what must, be, it, must it be like for, to, be, you know, to be that girl? all of the time. And another common one is um, children who can be visually overstimulated, so it's no good me uh, uh, you know, trying to teach a literacy lesson, I've got my big book here, I'm pointing at my big book, I'm try trying to teach phonics or something like that, and I've got this beautifully bright patterned geometric jumper on because the person with autism might just be looking at my jumper and have no interest whatsoever on what's going on in, in my book and you know, the whole lesson for that person could be pointless just because I've chosen the wrong clothing for the day. Um, we also have another example 
of uh, people we'd prepared really well for a transition visit to a possible new school. And he um, was prepared really, really, really well, but went in, said hello to the secretary, but unfortunately, to, immediately to the secretary, said, can't go here, you smell, and walked out of the school. So it wasn't being rude, wasn't being impolite, it was really important to him that everything was right, but for this boy, it wasn't right because he could smell something. Now, I'm sure this secretary probably just had nice perfume on, maybe hairspray, something like that. But it was a deal breaker for that boy. It was such, such a big thing when that was his first thing that he was confronted, for, confronted with. With sensory issues, it's important to decide what matters. I worked with a boy who um, didn't want to work, write with a pencil. Now, my instinct... Um, as a teacher might be, he's got to write it with a pencil. Seven-year-olds write with pencils. That's, that's what happens in school. But he, I got him to explain it to me. It's important to see past that. Does it make a difference? Is it a big deal if that boy writes with a biro for all of his life? No. He could, um, he could tell me why he didn't want to write with a pencil. He said it really hurt. He said it was like scraping his fingers on sandpaper. Um, for us, you know, the old description about scraping nails on chalkboards. I imagine it's something like that. And he could, could always politely tell the other people in his class that it was bothering him. And he went on to be able to describe a whole range of things that, that, that also bothered him in terms of sound as, as well. It wasn't the biggest deal. But there are some things that we have to deal with and we have to help our, our pupils learn to cope with. Telephones, for example. We had one boy who... And almost every time a telephone rang, and he, I think it was possibly the unpredictability of it as well as the sound, but those two things together, he would have really quite difficult outbursts, quite difficult challenging behaviour that would go on for a long period of time. We can't eliminate that from, from his life altogether. What we did, we put him on a desensitisation programme. I have to say, this desensitisation programme spanned four years, and we're not entirely out of the woods yet, but... It began with initially listening to clips on, on DVDs and CDs, listening to phone ringing, phones ringing outside of the room, reward for listening to one ring, two rings, five rings. Um, we then bought him a mobile phone and made it, that his individual education plan task, and we got people to ring him up, and he was ringing other people up. Uh, we then reinstalled the class phone at a, a very low volume and used it just at structured times when he was expecting it, so I would ring up and pretend to have something to say. And then we had the phone used at unstructured times, so randomly but still on low volume, then increased the volume, etc., etc., generalised to more rooms, more phones, and all the time liaising with parents about how similar strategies were working in the home as, as well. Needless to say, he's kind of almost there, but if he's, if he's anxious, if he's having, having a bad day, that, that can still be the one thing that, that upsets him. Social situations. Um, social situations. Where do you start? It's a huge area, really, that we can only summarise. But thinking about some of the themes today, it is one of the biggest issues that can make or break an experience in school. And I know that some of my fellow speakers today are going to be touching on issues such as friendship and, and bullying, and obviously will expand on, on that in much more detail. We've already mentioned how difficult it is for a person with autism to understand the social context, but understanding and knowing how to interact and behave affects so much of how a person is able to engage with their family, how much they're able to make friends, their experience of school, their ability to be fully included in the community, and their opportunities in terms of college and, and work. It really is such a huge area. The starting point is understanding the difficulties, some of the dis difficulties I've described on the screen, but not, not all of them, and not all of them are the same for every individual with autism. The last one isn't really um, a difficulty, it's more a strategy, the difficulty being that the person can have more, more difficulty with the playtime and that the strategy, therefore, is to give extra support. So sorry, the wording of that's a little, little backward. Once you've identified the social skills, you need to teach um, the social skills. And there's a whole range of social skills. You can teach them individually, in groups, in, in the classroom, in specific social skills groups, etc. Um, and those are some of the things, but not all of the all of the things that you can teach, 
teach in terms of social skills uh, work. The other thing that's important to do is to raise awareness of others. We've got a really good inclusion scheme going that um, every year we identify eight pupils that, and, and they're of all abilities, so from our most able to our lowest functioning children, go off to a local secondary school for some ICT lessons and they'll go back 30 times across a year. But to make that work, and it does work really well now, we've had a few problems, but we really had to do a lot of work with all the staff at that school and not all of the um, mainstream peers that they were going to be working along a long way. So that's also sometimes what happens to happen as, long, as well as working with the individual with autism, work with the people around them so that they understand and obviously have um, some very clear strategies um, for dealing with bullying. Bullying is, is itself a whole topic, but the key areas there are identification, policies and procedures, education, strategies to support the child, um, strategies to support the person who's bullying as well, um, and education, education for staff, peers and public, and I, I know that's, this is going to be picked up later today. I haven't got time to go through the wealth of social skills strategies out there. Um, there are really so, so many. You can buy books on them, you can buy packs, you can read up on them on the internet, you can attend courses. There's just a few here that, that I'm just going to quickly run through. Some, and these, some of these are kind of some cost and time effective ones as well. So this here, it's obviously just a simple board that says what you're learning about in PSHE and social skills, so rules in the community. The reason I've put this up is not because it's just a board in itself that's quite helpful, but it's important when we're doing social skills work to tell the person with autism what they're learning about and refer back to it constantly. So modelling, scaffolding. So you know, when something happens away from that social skills session, you, you'll say, Remind, remember what happened. Remember what we said when we did. What did you say you would do in? And making it generalise and otherwise there's a danger that social skills work can be just applied to that social skills group. A whole wealth of things around playground friends as well, lots of different schemes there. Um, and I know that this again is something that's going to be picked up this afternoon. But this one really is, is such an important area because it really ties in with that, that person's um, belief about themselves and how they feel about themselves, their self-esteem and their future desire to be sociable. We're a school quite near London and we have lots of visitors to the school. We have to, we have to keep a balance so our children get peace and quiet too but we have lots of fundraisers, people we meet at conferences and many people say to us, oh, I'm really surprised, lots of your children are really friendly and they are, many of our children love having visitors, they love the routine, they go up and say hello, introduce themselves, ask them who they are. There's a little bit of a myth sometimes about autism that people don't want to be sociable. That's not always true, many do, they just want to have the tools to do it and um, they want to have friends as well, so it's such, such an important time to get right. Another couple of examples of how to teach friendship skills. Social stories, um, Carol Gray does two day, three day courses on social stories. All I've got really time to say is that um, social stories are just so, so useful and work really, really well. Um, there's um, an NES video that I've seen a number of times where a lady's showing some visual jigs that she uses with her boy. Um, it's a parent that uses them in the morning to help her get her son up. And she says repeatedly, doesn't listen to me, but if the picture tells him to do it, he'll do it straight away. And she says that all the way through. Well, I feel a, li a little bit like that about social stories. It can take away all that work from the teacher. It can help the person with autism regulate themselves because they know what's expected. This one on the screen is just about the right times to put your hands up and not calling out in class. Okay, I'm just going to hand back to Linda for the last couple of slides. Okay, so we're nearly there. We've, we've got um, two more things that we think are vitally important in, 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 the, in the right environment. Um, one of the things I've learned in my time at school is we can't do it by ourselves and it, we've, I've really learned the importance of getting the right people and I've reflected time and time again about why some teachers and some support staff succeed where others can actually leave autism very very quickly or never reach the standards that other staff do 
And as far as I'm concerned, all of the good practitioners do have these characteristics. Um, the people I've been privileged to meet can be absolutely passionate about autism, and it isn't just a job. They do want to learn as much as they possibly can. And I think many of us actually stay in autism because we love what we do, but it's because it's so interesting and that we learn something new every day or every week and that those people are very self-motivated to learn much more about our practice and the research and, and learn far more about how to support people with autism. I'm not going to read through every one of them, but you can see, I think, that many of those things are key to actually working. And we're not now talking about knowing about autism or autism strategies. You can teach those things to people, but I do think they need to have these skills first. One of the things that I do think is important is you've got to actually be a confident person. And sometimes you go into a classroom and something's going wrong or something's not quite right. You've got to pretend you're confident. You've got to give those pupils in the class the feeling everything is okay. I might know what's what I might not know what's happening, but my goodness, thank goodness that teacher knows what's happening. So sometimes I haven't put in there, but we do need to be really good actors as well. Um, in terms of recruiting the right staff, we also need to think about keeping those outstanding staff. So that again is about building teams, developing support networks and investing in training. But again, I think more importantly, it's creating an ethos of mutual support. I really do believe that one of the strengths um, at my school is the fact that we do have problems, we do have issues, nobody has any egos. We often think, no, we don't know what to do about this. I've got no idea how to develop that further. How can we develop an anger management program for this particular child? And what we do is we're quite happy to say, we don't know, let's meet together and let's solve the problem together. And I think that's what co creates a really good, strong team. There's one other attribute that I've missed out on this slide, and I want to, we're going to reveal that attribute at the end, unless some of you can... Um, find it for me. Um, again, just our children, um, they don't learn because they want to pass exams necessarily. They don't learn because they want to please the teacher. So we've got to actually make sure that learning is motivating for them. So again, the top tip is make learning motivating by using some of these things that we've mentioned. Make it fun, make it exciting. The staff have got to actually come in and be happy, join in with the songs, make it clear to those pupils, we're gonna have the most exciting, fun time today. Come and see what we're going to do. It comes from the staff team. It needs to be relevant, it needs to be practical. Use pupils' interest. I think we've just given some examples of how we might use pupils' interests um, for reward, but you could also incorporate their interests in their lessons. Uh, when say we talked about reward systems. Um, we've just got one more slide. What do I do? <laughs> Help. <laughs> We thought it, sorry, we thought the video was embedded, but we believe no. it's separate now. And don't worry, you are going to get your coffee. It's literally 30 seconds. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> high expectations, always, always high expectations. Reach for the stars, everyone, and thank you very much.